dentists. We all have patients or restorative dentists. We all have patients who come to us with edentialism in the posterior maxilla, whether it be complete maxillary edentialism or partial maxillary edentialism with various treatment options to them. And Dr. Stefanelli is going to present a topic that I think really begs us to listen to and, and maybe to ask ourselves, how are we navigating these patients from a treatment solution perspective, but then also how are we actually, actually executing that treatment? So that's the key. So without further ado, I will introduce Dr. Stefanelli. He has a, a very interesting background. He's both an engineer and a dentist. Um, he holds an honors degree in civil engineering from Polytechnic University of Turin, as well as an honors degree in dentistry and dental prostheses from the Sapienza, sorry for my Italian, it's not so good today, uh, University of Rome. He holds a PhD in dental diseases, also from the University of Rome, the Sapienza. He has a faculty position in the master's program in implant prostheses, again, from the Sapienza, and please tell me how to pronounce this later. Um, Dr. Stefanelli is on the scientific board of computer-aided implantology, and he's the author of numerous articles on guided implant surgery. He lectures internationally on guided implant surgery, and somehow he also finds the time for private practice in uh, Rome, Italy. So Luigi, I leave the uh, computer to you and uh, I look forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. Okay, let's start. Good afternoon, everybody. And thanks to all to be here this afternoon to share this uh, webinar. The title of the webinar is the use of pterygoid implants for the treatment of the posterior atrophic maxilla with a minimal invasive approach and as alternative to short implants, zygomatic implants or sinus slip. Placing an implant in the posterior atrophic maxilla is always a challenge because of poor bone in terms of quantity in fact, the loss of a superior posterior teeth leads to a resorption of the alveolar bone crest or pneumatization of the maxillary sinus. And in terms of quality, in fact, in this area, the bone density is type three or four. Last but not least, the surgical access in this area could be difficult. The insertion of an implant in a poor bone quality has been demonstrated to have a higher rate of failure. In this uh, study, Jeffin and Berman reported a 35% of failure rate when the implants were placed in bone quality type four, in contrast with a failure of 3% when implants were placed in bone of type one, two, three quality. The role of the implant length seems to matter less on stress distribution with the exception of implants loaded in poor bone quality, where length appears to be more important factor affecting success rates, as you can see in this study reported in this slide. Several techniques have been described for placement and implant in the posterior atrophic maxilla. And they are sinus slip, zygomatic implants, or short implants. What I want to share with you this afternoon with this webinar is an alternative procedure with the use of a dynamic navigation system. And it's place an implant in the pterygoid area. This technique was described for the first time by Toulas and Tessier. They reported that atrophic posterior maxilla preserved 80% of the original bone corridor, and this is enough to insert a 13, 20 millimeter long implants. This technique 
involves three different bones, but one anatomical area. And these three different bones are maxillary tuberosity, the pyramidal process of the palatine bone, and the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. As you can see in this slide, with three different color, these three different bones involved in the pterygoid area. Maxillary tuberosity, pyramidal process of the palatine bone, and the, sphenoid, and the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone, but one anatomical area. In this slide, you can see that even if there is no available bone to plan an implant in the zone that ranges from 1.5 to 2.5, it remains available bone to plan and insert a pterygoid implant. You can see in the right side an implant of 22 millimeters and in the left side an implant of 20 millimeters. And also in this slide, in this slide, no chance to plan an implant in any area of the maxilla, it make, makes an exception to the pterygoid area, both right side and left side. And also in this slide, no chance to plan an implant in any part of this atrophic maxilla with the exception of the two pterygoid implants. So why I want to suggest you this procedure? Here you can see the advantages in using a pterygoid implant for the treatment of the posterior atrophic maxilla. And they are a minimally invasive approach, no bone, no bone grafting, is a pre predictable, avoid posterior prosthetic cantilevers, shorter period of treatment, is stable during the time, Immediate loading is possible, and there is a decreasing of the costs both for patient and dentist. If there is a clear cut advantage to use pterygoid implant, the question each one of us is asking probably is notwithstanding the above mentioned advantages why the pterygoid implants have not been widely used. There are two important factors that represent a limit to the spread of this procedure. And these two important factors are the free end insertion of a long implant in a high risk anatomic area and from a prosthetic standpoint, tilted posterior implants can also be difficult to restore compared to vertical oriented fixtures. Before to dig deeper into the surgical technique, let's have a look to this anatomical area. For the placement procedure of these implants, it is essential to have a thorough knowledge of anatomy involved because nearby vital structure can be injured during surgery. Now I'm showing with, with my mouse the edges of the pterygopalatine fossa. Here. With PF, the most cranial point of the pterygomaxillary joint, and here, the most caudal point of the pterygomaxillary joint. The distance between these two points is the pterygomaxillary column and it is estimated to be 13.5 millimeters. It is very important to identify, this, to identify this landmark in the CBCT and evaluate this distance before the surgery. All these operations are preoperative evaluations. Here another time the pterygopalatin fossa in which the maxillary artery enter in this pterygopalatine fossa and the descending palatine artery is one of the terminal branch of the internal maxillary artery and it descends 
from the pterygomaxillary fossa through the greater palatine channel and emerges into the oral cavity from the greater palatine foramen. Here you can see in the axial images the anterior posterior distance of the pterygopalatine column that is estimated to be 6.5 millimeters and the lateral medial distance that is estimated to be 9, 9.5 millimeters. With, with the use of the CBCT and the correct analysis of it, the angulation could be evaluated for each one of the patient specifically and in the best way. So it is important to identify the greater palatine channel. For example, in this slide, you can see the distance between the planned implants and the greater palatine channel is 1.7 millimeters. Yes, here are some pictures of the internal maxillary artery and the descending palatine artery that emerges into the oral cavity also in these images. Here the lateral process of the, the pterygoid lateral process of the stenoid bone. And now let's have a look to the surgical procedures. The posterior sinus wall, the pterygoid apophysis and the palatine bone guide the position of the pterygoid implants. It is important to understand that damage to the palatine artery due to the malposition of the pterygoid implant represent the major danger. Here you can see a picture of a paper published um, in 1994. Graves was the author of this uh, uh, paper. It's a very interesting uh, paper. A full thickness incision is made a few millimeters medial to the crest of the tuberosity from the pterygomaxillary fissure to the premolar area. The extension of the sinus floor yeah, and the available height under the sinus floor determine the coronal starting point usually the second molar, and the angulation of the implant direction here. But let's see which is the landmark to establish the direction of our pilot drill. The amular process of the medial pterygoid process is easily palpated in the oropharynx. And this process guide the clinician to determine the thickest part of the pterygoid pillar of the bone, usually in the central part of the two processes. Usually, five millimeters lateral from the amular process and 10, 14 millimeters above the most caudal point of the pterygomaxillar suture, we can find this thickest part of the bone. One, two millimeters of the apical part of the implant could emerge into the pterygoid fossa because no the vital structure are present in this area. We have seen the surgical technique to insert a pterygoid implant and also we affirmed that one of the factors that limit the use of this technique is connected to make this procedure free hand. Yes, you see in this slide a very interesting paper written by Verkusen and other authors, and they compared the accuracy of implant insertion by using static guides or free hand, mental navigation. And you see the, the, the errors reported by these authors and using these two different techniques. These reported errors are referred to the conventional implants that have a length of 10, 13 millimeters. Imagine what it can happen if instead of a traditional implant, 
a pterygoid implant with a length of 20 millimeters is, is used. This error could be five, six millimeters at apex with the same angular errors because the apical deviation is strictly dependent on the implant length. Today, the use of dynamic navigation systems for planning and execution in implant surgery has demonstrated improved accuracy outcomes when compared to freehand surgery. How does a dynamic navigation system work? It work, works like a GPS, so that these two cameras can make a real-time triangulation between the contrangle and the arch to be treated. In this way, dynamic navigation technology allows the clinician to not only utilize a computer-aided implantology option for guided surgery of pterygoid implants, but also to employ real-time verification and validation of positional accuracy in such high risk anatomic area. Now let's have a look to the accuracy of these systems. Here you can see a paper written by me and by my mentor and buddy George Mandelaris, in which we reported the results, the accuracy of 231 implants placed in healed ridges. And as you can see, the mean deviations reported are 0 0.71 millimeters at coronal point, one millimeters as apex deviations, and 2.26 degrees as angular deviation. Also, we evaluated if there is a learning curve in using the dynamic navigation system and that needs to be in. And if you look at the first 50 implants, you see that the errors were a little bit higher than the last 50 implants, in which the coronal error reported was 0 0.6 millimeters, the apex deviation was 0 0.85 millimeters and two degrees as angular deviation. Here there is another work published in the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry, written also by me and Dr. Mandelaris as well, and in which we reported the same errors by using the trace and place technology one millimeters at, as apex deviation and 2.5 degrees as angular deviation. If you look at the literature and if you look at the most important in vivo studies presented in the literature, you can see that the most uh, important works, works published are that one of Michael Block and the two works published by me and Dr. Manderaris. And if you look at the results, you can see that we reported one millimeter as apical deviation and a ranges of angular deviation of 2.5 to 3.5 degrees. That are not so bad results. Now, we, I want to share with, with you the, the protocol that I use to insert a pterygoid implant with the use of dynamic navigation system. Here, there is a, a partially dentulous patient in which I planned the two implants, one conventional implants and one pterygoid implant. A digital WhatsApp is es essential to, to proceed with the uh, prosthetic drive and implantology planning, as you can see in this uh, CBCT. Then, after the registration of the CBCT 
with the arch to be treated, an accuracy check is uh, an important step to be sure that everything is working well. And now you see that 0, 0.0 millimeters in terms of the accuracy check. After the accuracy check, you can start your osteotomy and you can see in real time your drill advancing into the bone. Here in this picture, also in this one and in the last one. Here there is the periapical X-ray and a post-operative CBCT and the evaluation by overlapping the preoperative plan with the postoperative plan in which we reported 0.85 degrees as angular error and 0.96 as apical deviation. And also for the conventional implant, 2.3 degrees as angular deviation and 0.552 millimeters as apical deviation. Also in this slide, there was a very, not, not a lot of bone available. So I planned the two pterygoid implants and this is the post-operative CBCT and these are the results. 1.70 degrees for the right pterygoid implant and 1.71 degrees for the left one. Now I want to share with you uh, how, how is uh, the, um, the planning of the uh, totally dentulous patients. And uh, I want to start with uh, a mistake I did uh, in this case. This was the preoperative CBCT. This was the, the planning for frontal implants and tube pterygoid. This was the post-operative CBCT, in which you can see the four frontal implants and two pterygoids, two pterygoids that seems inserted in a very accurate way. Here you see the, the, the results, 2.19 degrees for the right pterygoid implant and for the, the other four frontal implants, 2.11, 0 0.81, 2 0.05, 1.84, and 2.37 degrees for the left pterygoid implant. Here are summarized all six implants inserted, and as you can see, the results were, were very good. Here the, the Panorex for the provisional. But I want to share with you my mistake. In this slide, in fact, you can see that even if the planning seemed accurate and also the surge, surgery were done in an accurate way in terms of deviations between the planned and inserted implants, if you look at the implant directions in the gypsum cast, you can see that these implants direction are not the best for a prosthetic driven implantology. So a digital box up is mandatory for all these cases. In fact, this case is the correct workflow that needs to be followed for a right planning and an accurate and safe surgery. The analysis of the available bone and an intraloral scanning impression are preliminary operation as well as some pictures from intra and extraoral examinations. Then a digital box up using in this case Exocad was prepared and printed with 3D printed printer. The occlusal check as well as the aesthetic and phonetics checks are necessary operations before to pass to the next step.
Then we have the scan of the patient and the uploading of the DICOM images and digital WhatsApp in a dedicated software in order to prepare a prosthetic driven implantology plan unit, as you can see in this slide and also in this slide. Before the surgery, we need to register patient Joe to be treated with the CBCT data by touching chosen landmarks with the use of dedicated tracer. In this case, five ministries were used as landmarks. Okay. At each step, an accuracy check will enable the clinician to prove system accuracy and therefore the assurance that everything is set up to proceed with safe surgery. And after the accuracy check, then also in this case were very accurate, you can start your osteotomy. Now I want to show you a video, just a second. was treated by using the trace and place technology. Five mini screws were inserted and traced instead of the use of the residual pin. The software automatically recognized the mini screws. Once the tracing begins, an accuracy check is important to be done. In this case, you can see the error ranges between 0 and 0 0.2 mm. After the calibration of the drill axis and the drill feet, we are ready to start the osteotomy. As you can see, it is possible to follow in real time the advancing of the drill in the phone for an accurate, safe, and minimally invasive surgery. Also, for the insertion of triple implants as in this case, where we inserted the two pterygoid implants. After the osteotomy, the implants could be guided and it is possible to follow in real time their advancing into the bone as well. Okay. Okay, perfect. Here we are at the end of the osteotomy. Then 
the post operative CBCT with the four, in, four frontal implants inserted and the tube pterygoid. And also for this case, the accuracy evaluation by comparing the ending implants and the inserting ones has been carried out. It was possible by overlapping the post-operative images with the pre-operative ones. And uh, also you can see that uh, the accuracy is very good for uh, all most of the implants. Okay, here there is another case in which I planned four frontal implants and two pterygoids. Okay, this uh, is the, the setup. Okay, the CBCT, the planning. And then uh, uh, here is my first planning. because uh, during the surgery I changed uh, the position of these uh, implants. Implant mar marked here with the number 21. Okay, this is the, the planning, the registration of the arch to be treated by touching the landmarks. Okay. I started with the tube pterygoids and uh, the, the other tilted implants, the accuracy check, the calibration of the axis of the contrangle and the drill tip, another accuracy check, and then the osteotomy. Okay. Okay, at the end of the osteotomy, the other pterygoid and the end of the osteotomy. Then I passed to make the osteotomy of the two central implants. I started with uh, this one, but when I went to make the osteotomy of this implant, I didn't reach the right torque, so I decided to change my planning and to plan an implant in another position. I, I was using a dynamic navigation systems, system, so I was uh, allowed to, to do so. so I change my planning in another position. And these are the results. I want to say to, to tell you that for this one implant, this one, this one, and this other implant, I made I made the osteotomy with dynamic navigation system, but I made the insertion of the implant by freehand. But with these two implants, I made both the osteotomy and the session by using dynamic navigation system. And if you look at the results, yeah, yeah, you can see that the deviation were a little bit worse if the insertion is, is made by freehand instead that if you insert the implant by using dynamic navigation system. Okay. So it is important not only to make the osteotomy, but also to insert the implant by using dynamic navigation system, especially in the upper row where the bond density is very low. Here, there is a case that belongs to a, an ongoing uh, uh, study in which I insert one side, I treat one side freehand and the other side by using dynamic navigation system. And in this particular case, 
this was the planning. I treat the patient in the right side by freehand and in the left side by using Navident. The planning and here the, there are the, the results of the freehand, as you can see for the pterygoid of the right side, 14 degrees as angular deviation, 4.61 and more than 17 degrees for the third ones. If you look at the deviation by using dynamic navigation system, you, you, you can see that for the first implant, I reported an error of 0 0.64 degrees, 0 0.65 for the second one, and 1.78 for the pterygoid one. Okay. Here, there is uh, another paper in which also uh, accepted in the International Journal by, of Periodontics and the Restorative Dentistry, written also by me and my friend George Mandelaris, in which we evaluated the accuracy of implants placed in uh, partial edentulous patients and also these uh, pterygoid implants planed and inserted in the same patients, but inserted freehand. As you can see, we treated 39 patients for a total number of, imp of the pterygoid implants inserted of 63, 31 planned and inserted by using Navident, and 32 by using freehand. Zero implants lost by using dynamic navigation system and two implants lost by using freehand due to the malpositioning. These are the, the errors reported by using dynamic navigation system, 2.66 degrees as angular deviation and just a little bit more than one millimeter as apical deviation. If you look at the results by using freehand, you see as angular deviation more than 12 degrees and more than 2.5 millimeters as, as apical deviation. Also distance between the planed implants and greater palatine artery was uh, checked and the, the mean distance reported was 3.5 millimeters but if you look at the minimum distance, you can see that this distance was one millimeter. So it is very important to be sure and to identify the position of the greater palatine channel because sometimes this, this distance could be very low. Also, the mucosa thickness was evaluated and reported and the mean mucosa thickness reported was 5.41 millimeters but sometimes it uh, was calculated that 10 millimeters of mucosa thickness was above the planned implants so it is important to evaluate soft tissue reduction at surgery stage the implant length used were almost between 15 and, 20 and 18 millimeters and the multi-unit abutment used were almost of then 30 degrees 59 percent and just five times it does 80 percent of the cases more than 30 degrees customized multi-unit abutment but now we have a lot of solution that allows us to use uh, this angled multi-unit abutment. And that facilitated the use of the pterygoid implants for the rest of, for their restoration. If you look at the statistical analysis by using freehand or Navident, there is no history. All the deviation were statistical significant 
by using an evident versus free hands. So I want to stress another time you that the use of the rigoid implants represents a great advantage because it is a minimally invasive approach, no bone grafting, is a predictable treatment, require a shorter period of treatment, is stable during the time, immediate loading is possible, and there is a decreasing of the costs both for patient and dentists. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Luigi. That was really an excellent, excellent presentation. Um, you, you basically illustrated so well the anatomic intricacies, if you will, of the use of pterygoid implants. And you stated that, you know, this is a procedure that otherwise would be quite challenging and is, is really technique sensitive and really well illustrated how we can safely position these implants with predictability. And so much so that I almost look at this, you know, and look at what you've presented to say, how is it possible this isn't standard of care with regard to the placement of these implants? If we can minimize morbidity for patients, minimize complications, least invasiveness, I mean, you, you just look at this and say it's a no-brainer, right? Uh, we do have a lot of questions. Keep the questions coming. Thank you so much to um, all the participants uh, for submitting questions. So, a couple of questions that have come through that I'm gonna, going to run by you. I mean, in the vein of what I've just expressed to you, you know, have you, obviously you're a very skilled surgeon. You could, you've demonstrated that you can do it both ways, obviously more, uh, with more precision using Navident. And uh, the one thing I can say uh, when I've used Navident, you know, you think you're a good surgeon until you realize how precise uh, this forces you to be and you realize, oh, I'm not as precise as I thought I was. So would you say that you pretty much routinely now for the placement of pterygoid implants use dynamic surgery have you, have you sort of changed your practice that this is the norm i don't know if you can hear me uh, i think your microphone is off okay now Perfect. probably you can hear me could you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Just a second. I put my last slide and then I answer to you. Okay. Okay. Yes. Uh, I started to, to learn this technique uh, uh, by freehand, but uh, it uh, required me a lot of time, sometimes uh, some intrasurgical x ray and uh, a very um, uh, stressing uh, surgical procedure but uh, yes now uh, the, the time to insert a pterygoid implant uh, uh, is a very very slow very very um, short by using dynamic navigation it requires not more than two minutes to make the first osteotomy and to insert the implant and uh, the fact that uh, you can follow on the screen the, um, the position of your drill uh, gives you a, a great advantage because uh, you are sure that everything is done in an accurate way. So yes, it changed uh, my way of procedure and uh, yes, sometimes in uh, some course, I make uh, one implant free end and the other uh, with dynamic navigation system. But for my practice, uh, I treat all the patients by using dynamic navigation system when uh, I plan to insert a pterygoid implant. Yes, I mean, I think that makes sense. I think when we're dealing with scenarios where you have potential, you know, you talked about the, the anatomic risks, potential high complication rate. Um, and, and obviously this is, this is uh, dependent on the skill of the surgeon too, but you, you mentioned that, you know, probably this technique, the use of pterygoid implants, although we've talked about this for many, many years, um, certainly I know they're not, there are, there are some, but it's not universally applied among 
you know, clinicians, oral maxillofacial surgeons, periodontists, or, or those people who are executing this treatment. And uh, certainly I think this gives it more of a, a safety zone, if you will, knowing exactly that you can plan the implant on the computer and then execute it in a precise fashion. Um, from a learning curve perspective, just using this technology, um, you know, for someone who hasn't used this before, can you just comment on your experience in that? How difficult is that? Is the learning curve going from I'm looking at the patient and in the patient's mouth to now I'm looking at a computer screen and not really having to look at the patient? Is it, is it challenging to do? Is it a, a, as a, as a each thing, if you decide to use a, a system and you want to use a, it in a, very well, uh, you have to, to change your uh, habits. So when I decided to use uh, dynamic navigation systems, I used it for our implants. And uh, also for the intralora scanner or for the microscope, there are always the, the learning curves to, to begin. But uh, if we want to estimate the numbers of the implants uh, that you need to jump the learning curve, I can say 50 implants are, um, yes, uh, uh, probably the, 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 the right uh, numbers of implants to not to use the dynamic navigation system, to make a pterygoid surgery in a safe way. Um, yes, 50 implants are the, 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 the right number to, to plan and execute a pterygoid implant uh, in an accurate way. But uh, the, the, yes, you told that not a lot of clinicians use pterygoid implants, probably because the most important thing for uh, uh, the pterygoid implants is the, to, to insert it in the correct position. In fact, if you look at the, the results and the cumulative survival rate reported in literature, for example, there is a, a very interesting work by Araujo and other authors. They reported 94% of uh, cumulative survival rates over 10 years, but uh, the 6% of implant lost were referred to the first period in which the, the implants were inserted, before the loading. So they lost the implants for malpositioning. All the implants that were loaded stay there without uh, any kind of problems over 10 years. So insert the pterygoid implants with the use of dynamic navigation system could offer the clinician a new chance, a new possibility for the treatment of the atrophic uh, uh, upper jaw. Would you say it's improved your ability to provide immediate loading for the patients because of such uh, precision placement and, and inherently good uh, initial stability? Yes, another, yes. Um, because you can reach uh, 90 Newton per centimeter of torque and uh, you can uh, also use a Versa drill, for example, just to, to compact the bone and uh, yes, you can reach very high torque and that uh, allows, to you, allows the clinician uh, to make the immediate loading. We have a question here um, with regard to any complications that you've experienced placing these implants, if you've had a bad bleed, if you've had to deal with a bad bleed, how you would. Um, any comments on that, given the nature of, of the region that we're dealing with? The, the, the complete, a lot. You have to think that the greater palatine artery is uh, quite parallel to the implant, uh, the pterygoid implant planed. So it is uh, very difficult to cut the, the, the descending palatina, palatine artery because it's parallel to the pterygoid implant. So I didn't report any severe bleeding, 
the, the, the complication reported is the malposition of the malpositioning of the implants. It does that I didn't reach the, the right stability for the insertion of the pterygoid implants. So, but it always uh, was due to the, um, to the malpositioning of the, 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 this implant. If you plan and insert the implant in the correct position, you cannot have some uh, complication. And this is a very useful implant because you can reach very high torque that uh, is very good for the treatment of, of this um, area of the maxilla. And what, what in, do you have an implant system? I know people hate to answer this, but do you have an implant system of preference that you prefer to use for these? I don't know, can, uh, can yeah, you yeah, hear yeah, me? Yeah. Yes, I I'm use uh, now. I'm using now the, the, the implants of Norris Medical that uh, has uh, um, a lot of uh, implant lengths, more than 20, 22, 24. So they give you a lot of solutions. But uh, yes, it is very very. Um, uh, stable implants and uh, uh, I used a lot of uh, implant brands and uh, I didn't find any difference in using different uh, brands of implants. During this period I'm making some studies with uh, yes Norris Medical and uh, the, the, the implants uh, that they provide are uh, very easy to be used, very because there is a, a smooth part at the coronal uh, uh, part of the implants, and uh, especially when you have uh, um, the mucosa thickness that uh, has at least uh, seven, eight uh, millimeters, uh, it could be useful to have a smooth part of the implant at the coronal uh, position. And, and when you're placing these implants, typically, where do they emerge crestally along the ridge? Is it variable depending on the underlying anatomy? Um, I, I suspect one of the benefits using this technology is that you can really pre-plan, not just obviously as you've shown, and, and how important it is to plan the position of the implant, but you can you know, overlay the prosthetics and you can see exactly where it's going to emerge prosthetically. So, Typically, what do you see in your practice as to how far distally these patients are being restored? So does the implant typically end up in the well, second uh, molar? Yeah, uh, the second molar is uh, the most uh, used position at the emergence of the, the pterygoid implants. Sometimes you, you have a, a more distal position, but uh, in my practice, I try to reach the second molar as a final position of the emergence of the, the pterygoid implants. Okay. And have you found in the past, I certainly have cases where you plan using static guides, you know, very early on in the day, um, and the armamentarium used to, to place a static guide can be quite cumbersome sometimes. So you place the guide, you plan it on the computer, and then you get to the patient's mouth, and you just you can't actually execute the procedure because now there's no room for the, the guide, the extended drill, so on and so forth. So have you found that this has really allowed you to, you know, treat patients that otherwise you couldn't treat um, with this technology? Because let's face it, working in the posterior maxilla, it can yeah. be challenging. Now we're talking about posterior, posterior maxilla, it's even harder. There is, there is a very interesting uh, paper published by Breling, as uh, I can't, uh, yes, Breling, 
in which he planned and inserted zygomatic implants and pterygoid implants by using, by using static guides. When he uh, treated and inserted the implant, the pterygoid implants when, with the static guides, he was able just to use the pilot drill because the limited uh, opening mouth uh, was uh, uh, an obstacle to, to pass the other drills and to insert the implants. So the, the, the error reported, uh, I can't remember exactly, but uh, was at least uh, 15 degrees by using the static light because he just used the pilot drill and then he proceed, uh, proceeded the freehand. So for the pterygoid implants, it is uh, very important to, to use dynamic navigation system for another reason, because uh, with static guide, you put the guide and uh, yes, you proceed uh, uh, in, a, in a blind surgery. But uh, when you use dynamic navigation, at each step, you can make an accuracy check. And uh, in such high risk anatomic area, the accuracy check is uh, very important to be sure that everything is done in an accurate way. Only if you have an accurate accuracy check, you can pre perform a, a safe surgery. Okay, you, I think you've, you've answered this question. Someone's asked, um, is there anything that can cause misplacement of an implant or malpositioning of an implant if you think you've done everything correctly. So if you follow the protocols, if you've done the accuracy checks, is it still possible that you end up with an implant not in the correct position? Yeah, yeah. So I think, I think the reality is... It, it is, a, no, it uh, can happen that uh, the, the, the density is uh, very low. So what can happen? is that uh, you cannot reach the, the stability of that, uh, yes, you, you, you have to, to not to insert the implant, but uh, if you make all the operation, all the step in uh, the accurate way, it is uh, quite difficult to, to malposition the, the, the implants, but uh, it requires of course, a, a thorough knowledge of the anatomic area, a, a thorough knowledge of the, the system used. So the, the inaccurate planning and, uh, and a good experience is uh, necessary to, to use this, this type of, uh, of the alternative uh, uh, when you treat the, the pterygoid area. Okay, thank you. So certainly, I mean, there are a lot of sort of little checks along the way, whether it's planning, uh, whether it's tracking the devices, whether it's execution, it really helps us to be as precise as possible. And I think what you're saying, and I agree with, is if you follow the protocol, uh, the way it should be done, we can place these implants precisely and there's really no reason for malpositioning of an implant. Yeah. I, I'd like to wrap it up, Luigi, by, by asking you sort of a final a question, which is really, you know, uh, as I said, you've been incredibly um, concise and, and uh, great explanation with regard to the use of Navident, but with regard to pterygoid implants. But what would you say, you know, if you wanted uh, people as the t best take home message with regard to this presentation? What would be sort of your, your final thoughts or words with regard to uh, using this technology for pterygoid implants? Yeah, yeah. My takeaway message is a uh, uh, simple start looking back to pterygoid implants as a, a viable solution for atrophic maxilla. Uh, in fact, uh, dynamic navigation has democratized this treatment Opening, opening it up to a larger number of clinicians, and uh, I am one of them. All right, thank you. I, as I said in the beginning, I, I, I can't agree with you more. Uh, 
you know, in the North American way, I would say this is, this seems to me just like a no brainer with regard to this technology and, and placement of these implants, which really allow for a minimally invasive way to treat the posterior maxilla and allows us to treat patients that sometimes, you know, wouldn't otherwise be able to be treated because of more extensive surgery. So with that, Luigi, thank you so much uh, for your time for this afternoon. And I thank all of the um, attendees uh, with regard to their time. And hopefully you've found this as um, informational as I have. And if there's any other questions or we haven't asked, answered any questions, I know myself and Luigi included, we're more than happy to answer anything. So if you wanna reach out to us or to him directly, uh, we welcome that. So thank you very much. Thank you to you. Thank you, doctors. That was really a great presentation, Dr. Stefanelli. I really enjoyed it, very informative. Thank you to the attendees for joining us. And Dr. David, really appreciate the way you handled the questions and the moderation. Perfect. My pleasure. Thank you. A great presentation. And to all of you that attended, within 24, 48 hours, you'll be receiving an email to the email that you registered with. And in that email, you'll find the link to your CE credits and also a link to the recorded version of this webinar. So I hope everybody's well and safe and thank you again. Take care. Thank you.